Recording is on. Is on. Good morning, everybody. It's Sunday, November the 7th, and this is the Eastern Extinction Rally meeting. Um, okay, so for today, since Ryan is here, I think um, we should carry on with the AI discussion because I was enjoying that. <laughs> I hope other people were. Um, does anybody have anything else to say before we, we start, or does anybody want a different subject? Anybody bored with this one? Uh, or does anybody want us to take it in a new direction, or are we doing okay for uh, what we discussed so far? Or if there are any uh, terms or anything that we glossed over that were creating confusion that, that we should uh, identify. Oh, thank you. Yes, no, I, I'm not like you, um, knowledgeable in, in, uh, in computing, but I, I've looked up the terms that you used and I've, I've tried to, to understand a bit what you're talking about so i'm okay personally there might be other okay yeah mm. we'll try to do better I'll, I'll i'll try to do better uh he does a pretty good job but um we'll uh uh stop us if there's anything that um that gets confusing okay yeah i like to use like analogies and and I always think that, you know, if, uh, you know, it's that thing, if, if you can't, uh, it's, I can't remember who said it, some physicist said, if you can't really under explain your theory to grandma, you you don't actually probably understand it yourself. <laughs> so I think all good theories should be able to, to be explained without jargon and without getting too, too technical. Um, so, long gone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, he's not as a uh, hundred million registered employees. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so okay. So let's uh, if we if we carry on. Um, if you if we carry on uh, on the same line of discussion. So, just to recap, where I was going with this, and uh, just to uh, level set again, is that uh, we're in the pursuit of what is intelligence, and the reason why I think it's valuable is that I don't think artificial intelligence is going to solve all the world's problems. In fact, it's going to create a lot more than it solves. But it's uh, it's useful for us to see ourselves. So it's a useful tool for our own enlightenment. And I think that that's where we'll get to if we just nail down what intelligence is. So what I'm slowly... ...intelligence really is. So going back to the last discussion we had, I was proposing this thing that, well, let's take, for instance, what you know, what stupidity is. Okay, so first, as a kind of counter argument to stalk intelligence. So uh, then I said, basically, if something's completely random and you have a random number generator, you have to say, well, this is stupid because whatever you interrogated with in a kind of Turing test, it comes up with garbage. And so you can clearly say, well, this is not very intelligent. On the other hand, if you something's too consistent, uh, you know, if you say, she loves you, she loves you not, she loves you, she loves you not, she loves you, she loves you, you're always going to get she loves you not out of this machine. Then you can assume that it's not very bright uh, if that's all it puts out. Now, according to Gregory Chaitin, and I like this idea, is that you cannot really tell whether something's random unless you actually look at the mechanism that, that generates it. So what, we, what we're doing with um, AI is we're continually making the mistake of looking at the output and saying it's intelligent. And I don't think it is, <laughs> not even close. But it's fooling us, particularly because it's appealing to our alien cortex. And so uh, it's not, um, 
Uh, you, to actually tell whether it's intelligent, you have to lift up the hood and see the mechanism that generated. So if you lifted up the hood of, say, a machine and then said, <clears throat> you know, you can't do a Turing test. Turing test is bunk because the Turing test presupposes that you can tell from the output what intelligence is. And I'm saying, no, you can't, just like you can't tell what randomness is. That's my argument. So I say, if you lift up the hood uh, of this machine that was supposedly artificially intelligent, you would perhaps say, for hypothetically, you would have an example where, oh, you say, okay, I see what they did. They got random noise out of the universe, just put it through a lexical grinder and popped out a, an answer. So saying, well, this is not intelligent. You could tell that straight away from first principles. Then if you had another machine that says, you know, whatever the input is, just print out, she loves you not. And you say, whatever you say, she loves me, she loves me not. That's all you're going to get. It's just a you know, a simple loop program that puts out one. And you can also say, well, that's too consistent. It's too predictable to be intelligent. So then intelligence must lie somewhere between these two. And I'd say on the edge of chaos, and it's, um, it's on the a boundary condition between these, these two. So, so then what exactly is it? And why does um, AI not, is just approximate it or mimic it, but not actually achieve it? And, and never will, in fact, is one of my predictions, if you agree with all this eventual argument. But I'll get to what I think intelligence is. But the first thing I wanted to say in this one is, I would propose that taking the model that we had before is like, well, the departure point for intelligence is our intelligence. So you have to say that the benchmark is the human brain, and we're trying to mimic the human brain. We kind of say, well, what the human brain does is it's just a specific instance of some kind of capability called intelligence. And so, you know, <clears throat> the idea is that intelligence is an emergent feature of our brains, but it exists in an abstract form, and somehow we can know it. I don't think so. I think that um, it's the other way around. It's basically intelligence leads to the human brain. So it's kind of, we've got everything upside down. But, okay, so then... I would also say that if you take the human brain as uh, a departure point for intelligence, then you must, it, it must, you, you would have to say, if your mechanism that you are claiming is artificially intelligent generates intelligence, you would also expect it to, to generate the things, the artifacts that, that humans do. For example, <clears throat> it should be able to go on a psychedelic trip. It should be able to you know, have epilepsy, um, psychosis, all these kind of things, uh, you would at least, uh, you know, have to model them. There is things like neurosis. I mentioned that Theseus, the mouse, um, called Shannon's mechanical mouse that winds through the maze, they found that it could easily get into a loop, a fixed loop that the psychologists in the Macy Foundation, they immediately said that, that you've mimicked a human neurosis. And I think that, it, that is. So it's a, human neurosis is a loop that you just can't get out of. You get stuck in a never-ending cycle. Of loop. And I think that's a good model for neurosis. So you can mimic a, a neurosis and you say, well, okay, what about something like a NASA trip or a psychedelic trip? And what would it, that even look like in a machine? Well, I posted that a little video there on ExxonMed. Um, of this acid trip uh, in the supermarket. So uh, this guy generated this acid trip. Now, he didn't say how he did it, but I mean, again, look, you know, if you look under the hood and <laughs> look at the mechanism, uh, I think where he got that from, I, I strongly suspect he got that from Google. So what, what happened at Google is they looked at the image recognition uh, system and they wanted to know what it's really seeing. If you just give it a, you know, a reel of um, video footage, like, you know, a normal shopping trip through, through a supermarket, what does it actually see? And they were amazed to see that it's, it's looking at things like, you know, a t-shirt of somebody walking past and then they say, oh, that's the head of a puppy. And it looks at, you know, boxes of cereal up on the, on the, in the shelves there and, Maybe because they have Tony the Tiger or something, but suddenly you get a row of tigers' faces, and it looks strangely like an acid trip. So, 
I think uh, we should go into exactly what an acid trip is, why why humans are having them. So if you lift the hood on humans and you say, you know, what what's happening with an acid trip, uh, and would it be possible even for for AI to have the same kind of experience? So, uh, and also from that, hopefully we can get to like the quaya and the sensation. So, so. We, again, I think we have it upside down that we think if things get complex enough, then we get to consciousness and feelings and qualia. <laughs> and qualia is things like the, the red, no, redness, you know. The, when you look at something red, if you're not colorblind, it looks so damn red you know, as opposed to green. And when you feel sick, you feel very sick. <laughs> and you know, all those kind of feelings, it's hard to imagine how a machine feels them, but they, they assume, oh, well, you know, like the movie AI, if you make it complex enough, eventually it'll stop doing that. Now, it's the other way around. It's, uh, the qualia come first, all the feeling. If you look in the evolutionary tree, you can see the neural apparatus is building up from the bits like the amygdala, the limbic system, the bits of the feeling things, the fish brain. So I think, and I mean, I spend a lot of time interacting with fish these days. I think the fish are, full of qualia, it's it's possible to imagine being a fish or being a, a slug or something, and it's just raw feelings. It's kind of um, the opposite of being in a dream. I know often dreams are not so feeling. If you just imagine raw emotions of smell, um, you know, you, you just imagine a continuous stream of like a coffee smell, um, a feeling of anxiety, the you know, taste of honey, um, just a sound, uh, you know, and just imagine a continuous stream without any thoughts, without any words. Um, that's the fish's world. It's it's its whole body is an ear, so it's it's all just feelings, feelings, feelings. So it's I think that disturbs people a lot because they like to think, you know, that animals are dumb, and you know, it's only when you get to be human that you start to feel. And I think that's the, you know, the justification for the RSBCA and cruelty to animals is they're all feeling, they're just feeling toned all the way up. And really, by the time you get to humans, we're less feeling. I mean, I don't know, you know, by the time you get to a psychopath, they're all in the alien cortex. And that's what they're noted for is um, anhedonia, those kind of dampening feelings. So, so okay. So, now, um, if you say... Um, Okay, now what, what's actually going on with, with an acid trip? So if you look at all these neurotransmitters, DMT and psilocybin and MDMA and um, LSD, all, all these things and what they do, they, they have a rough idea of what they do, but you can, you can guess. Um, and they, they all mainly mess with the serotonin receptors. So what that, <coughs> why does that give you an acid trip? Um, and uh, the the reason is that they, well, they, first of all, they used to think it were, they were excitatory. So they they thought that they excited your neurons and made them made it kind of uh, the junctions easier to bridge, so that you know your synapses had um, less activation potential. So in other words, your your brain was getting more hysterical. It's it it is kind of like that because. Qualitatively, people who have, uh, you know, in psychosis or if they're in on an LSD trip, or in, uh, they resemble somebody in panic. They make snap judgments. You know, in other words, you, you see Tony the Tiger on the cereal packet, and you start to see tigers and weird things, and so. And it's uh, it's easy to see that in that aroused state, it must have evolved because. It's showing you everything. It's got the volume turned up on all the pattern recognition. And it's easy to see, well, you know, for an animal in the jungle like us, a primate, um, false positives are cheap. You know, if, if you see a tiger and it isn't a tiger, it's just leaves, that's kind of safe. But if you see a tiger and you think, oh, it's just leaves, well, that's a false negative that's really, really has bad consequences. So as a result, when we're in an aroused state, if we're walking through the graveyard, we're whistling through the graveyard, we start to see shapes everywhere and tombstones seem to have faces. We have, I can't remember what you call it when you see faces of them. Per the Peridolia. Peridolia, that's, that's the one. Yeah. So 
so again, if you see, you know, periodelia and you, know, you see the face on Mars, then everybody gets excited because they say, well, that's, you know, a, an example of aliens. But again, it's the output. You have to ask what created that face on Mars. And you say, well, it's weathering and weathering is a random process. There's no evidence for tooling or machine or designing or anything like that. So you would say the process that made it was unintelligent and the output it fools you into thinking it's intelligent because it looks like a face, but that intelligence is really in, in you. So going back to an acid trip, when you see faces, you have paradelia and stuff all over the place, easy to make up a story for we evolved to do that because uh, it's a heightened uh, situation, it's a dangerous situation, and then you should be in panic. So you see that the limbic system is probably making all these um, serotonin adaptations to say, you know, we're in deep, deep shit here, you better be hyper alert. And then that hyper alert creates visual hallucinations and things like that. So, so it's, it seems like from the Google example that, that AI can do those kind of hallucinations. It seems like the pattern recognition and image recognition can hallucinate in, in a certain extent. So, but why does it qualitatively seem different? Uh, the reason for a person, especially on an LSD chip, it seems like the realest thing known to man. And, and, and why isn't everybody in a normal waking state? When you go into the supermarket, why don't you see the an acid trip like somebody who on an you know, LSD trip or in psychosis or, would, or in panic would start to see all tigers and stuff on the shelf in the supermarket? And so uh, the, what they found is that it, it's not all excitatory. So uh, when they look at the neurons, some of them are actually inhibitory. In fact, most neurons are actually inhibitory. So what happens is you, you know, they detected, oh, they're getting, all the neurons are getting excited. But some of, the, some of them were getting excited and the net result, the cascade that they caused was actually inhibitory to most of them. So then you say, well, when I walk through the supermarket, are there parts of my brain that sees tigers and puppies' faces on T-shirts and it's all being suppressed? And say, well, not really. <laughs> and I don't think so. And I have to go into some explanation to, to say, and I think it's worthwhile going into this explanation because it'll start to unfold it maybe a little bit more about what intelligence is. So, so how is it possible that you don't have tigers and things being represented by parts of your brain and other parts of your brain to say, shut the, shut up, we're in a, we're in a supermarket. <laughs> it's like those, those are not tigers. And you can happily go and shop without, you know, getting put in a white jacket. Um, so the, I think the reason is, okay, what they found is that uh, the dampening effect is on the, I think it's called the anterior cingulate gyrus. But anyway, it's a big, junction, it's kind of like imagine a railway junction. So it's a very important hub in all the connectome in your brain. And it is, I keep on going on about the COP, the COP thing, the not the COP26, but the COP in your brain. The, there's always this COP. And I mentioned that, you know, in the cult thing that I was in, just when you're about to have this, you know, amazing shared intersubjective LSD trip experience, this, this big trip, then there's always this cop that comes in and shuts it down. And that cop, I think, is located in your anterior cingulate gyrus. I hope I got the right module. But anyway, it's it's a well-known exchange. It's kind of, they think of it kind of like an executive uh, module. So it's it's kind of like a, a traffic cop or otherwise uh, maybe somebody that directs traffic, um, you know, or an executive in a company so that, you imagine a general on a battlefield gets a lot of information. The general um, decides which is important and then suppresses some messages and propagates others. You remember my mentor, Tom, was like we're really wired into the global network of you know, movers and shakers. And, and I said, you know, his, his, his more active role was uh, suppression of things. So basically, he would get lots of ideas and information and just tons of people talking to him, influential people. 
and what he and he had so many people that listened to him and uh, took his advice and if he said something it was had a lot of impact so he had to be careful what he said and what he propagated so he you know if you come to him with a story of hey cold fusion is the next thing he wouldn't go and run around telling everybody oh cold fusion is the next thing or ai is the next thing uh, he's he would sit on it and he told me that yeah he would sit on until he heard it something from three credible sources he wouldn't start to propagate it and i said to him yeah well you know i noticed looking at him i said that the the bigger effect that he has he thought his effect was what he propagated and i said to him no actually it's what you suppress is is the bigger effect that you have on the world as a network node as this preferential network node um in in the world society and so uh he thought about it for a bit and came back and he said, yeah, he, I was right. He thinks that. And I think it's the same with this, you know, anterior singular giant. The cop makes it seemingly intelligent, makes the human brain seem intelligent because it's, you know, it's making a salience landscape by filtering out all these erroneous things. Now, how does that, or how does that happen? Where does the smarts to do it? it? It comes from context. So in other words, imagine something like this. If you look at that video of the acid trip in the supermarket, you can clearly see the machine is looking at a T-shirt and going, oh, that's a puppy face, because it's been trained to recognize animals. Now, the singular gyrus wouldn't allow us to do it because it says, uh, you know, we're in, we're in a supermarket. The, they, we can see that the, that's, you know, a pair of genes correctly identified. By, and so then... As soon as we're in the territory of jeans, we assume T-shirt. So therefore, it's a human wearing jeans and T-shirt. And we know that, you know, if you're in jeans and T-shirt, you suppress the puppy face or the tiger or whatever thing. Because it's like, clearly, we're not in that context. And so that's that's what it's doing, I think, in, in terms of a, a junction of, a, you know, allowing messages through and suppressing others. Uh, and so... The machine doesn't have uh, the AI like image recognition. It doesn't have that context. It's it's not modal. It just has puppy images, and it it has no context. It never says, "Hey, what is the chance of a tiger appearing in the supermarket shelf other than as Tony the tiger on the cereal packet?" It's like it's zero chance of a tiger. But now, when you're on an acid trip, suddenly you apparently lose context. And you start to see tigers and shit on the, you know, in the patterns in the supermarket and shelf where they just clearly are. So you say, well, how is this? And then I said this before, and I'll I'll, I'll go over it again um, because it's important. But one, now before I go over this, I would definitely not want to help anybody. If you're listening to this and you program artificial intelligence or supervised or unsupervised learning machines or anything like that is like if you use what i'm telling you i swear i'll hunt you down and kill you so i'm not telling you this to improve ai i think ai is a plague and i definitely don't want to help anybody but if you wanted to make better ai then the way to that and make it the way the way to do it is to make it multimodal and make it more like our brain so what is our brain doing and I've, I've, I've said this before that it's it's in this context so what makes it so powerful is combinatorial so imagine this uh, say in AI you normally have this kind of feed forward uh, neural mesh network and uh, it really only has weighted modes and that's how it works it says you know What's my and and the they have the model of the human brain also they think of it like that they think well it's kind of like a transistor if it has all these actions and inputs then it has an activation potential and a weight and if the weight is exceeded bang it goes and propagates the signal and it's like no I don't think that's what it's doing at all <laughs> sorry neurologist um, uh, what it, what it's doing is it's more like this. Imagine you had, you could do this in software. It's not difficult. Is you would have uh, what's called global variables. So in other words, in uh, each each um, neural node in the network would have reference to say, let's say ten global variables. Now, what are those global variables? 
the way to see them is in biology is they're the concentrations of those neurotransmitters. So there are various neurotransmitters that are changing the action potential of the neurons. For, for example, you get particularly things like dopamine, dopamine and glutamate and, um, uh, you know, all the, the uh, things like cortisol and estrogens and every, all of these hormones and chemicals and that. It's a big chemical soup, but all of them have a certain kind of um, concentration. Now, if you imagine, say, an artificial intelligence, you say, okay, well, they've got 10 neurotransmitters and all of these neurons you simulate there in a soup. In other words, you just have global variables that have, you know, various concentrations of these hypothetical uh, chemicals. Now, what happens is it makes the neurons extremely smart because they don't just say, okay, what's my input potential and weight and do I propagate the signal or not? They, they say based on the uh, combinations of the neurotransmitter. So in other words, um, think of it like this. The neuron gets an input signal and says, oh, I think I'm about to fire. But it goes and says, but I must check. Is like, what's the serotonin level? What's the dopamine? What's the glutamate? And it's only, you know, say, is it one of my magic keys? And so it would have, you know, states where it would say just that combination of chemicals and neurotransmitters means that I fire if, you know, if all else is good. Then you might have five or six more and they say uh, and say then you know those would also be conditions for it to fire now if you have a look at the combinatorics of those 10 neurotransmitters and say each one of their concentrations is extremely important um, you will find that uh, there's a combinatorial explosion that makes each individual neuron massively massively complex and the the, the reason is um that um uh it's uh it's multimodal so it has it has a lot more conditions for whether you know it fires and once it's fired it also says when it can fire again so it says you know and then the the other trick is it's not only um excitatory it's also inhibitory so you have all these huge conditions you have whether the new inhibitory and then um you, you also have this, you know, it's very conditional on exactly what neurotransmitters that are there. So it's like, is there any kind of proof for this? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's plenty of proof. Well, you imagine this. So you surely you've, you've had this experience where you've gone out to the pub and you have like 10 beers or something and you, everybody's telling jokes and you're all having a great old time. Remember, the next day, you cannot remember a single one of those jokes. Why? Because you no longer have that level of, you know, of alcohol. So the alcohol is changing the, the action potential. So, but in some mode, it ha your brain has wired together with a heavy in response. So, you know, what fires together, wires together. But the wiring together, although superficially it might look like the connectome is wired together for all modes, it's not really. It's wired together for 10 alcohol, 10 beer level uh, um, wiring, if you see what I mean. So then when you sober the next morning, you can't remember a single joke. But, you, you know, what happened that evening. But have 10 beers again, and suddenly it all comes back to you. Suddenly you can remember all the jokes, you can remember what people said, you're kind of back in this new realm. The same thing happens to you with LSD. So in other words, heightened stimulus and in, in high stimulus environment puts you back into uh, where you're, you know, the state you were when you actually had this memory formation. So, uh, so in other words, you know, if you, if you get into a heightened memory state, then you start to see tigers uh, because they wind up in evolution even um, for that level of just that level of, um, of cortisol and adrenaline and all, all of these uh, things that put it in that mode. But uh, when you uh, get into a new level of, uh, of different combinatorics of concentrations of the neurotransmitters, then you're in a whole new world. Uh, and so then you might not be able to remember 
um, what happened to you when you walk through the graveyard. You might have a traumatic uh, event, and then they say, oh, well, you have a suppressed memory. No, you have an inaccessible memory. You probably can access that memory again if you get into that state again. And you, you, um, there are plenty of examples of this. I don't think it's too out there as a theory. So uh, then what happens to the normal person when they go to a supermarket is they putting themselves in a, uh, you know, they're going on the shopping trip. They immediately in this mode, uh, a ha habitual mode, they have a certain level of dopamine. It's, it's a lot of, you know, the reason why they get into those levels of neurotransmitters is because of past habit and association. So when you first go to the supermarket, you probably go with your mom. And you have, you know, it's kind of exciting, and you probably have a bit of dopamine, and um, you know, um, there's an expectation of reward and things like that. So you have a kind of level set of these neurotransmitters. Um, that's kind of like a lock and key thing. And by habit, every time you go to the supermarket, you're, you know, just the logo of the supermarket, the fact that you prepared and you did a little shopping list and everything will put you in that mode. Now, in that mode, you just saw products on the shelf and made these associations and saw t-shirts and jeans and no tigers. And so that becomes an entire um, shopping experience. It's an entire world that's based on the level set of all these hormones. And then you get into you know the action potentials why previous in that same level. So I hope uh, that makes sense, but it's saying that the neurons are being reused. They, they're not being, you know, they're pretty much single use, single mode things in most neural nets. So they, you kind of um, uh, basically have a waiting and then they propagate forward. But they don't have this kind of incredible complexity and so this explosion of combinatorics. So, so the, now that's one thing. Now, the other thing that is saying, if we look under the hood and see is, you know, how complex can these things be and what's the limit? The other thing is, is uh, what we mentioned before, and that's the digital. If, as soon as something is digital, it's, it's got a number of problems. One of them is the clock and it's, um, uh, it's um, approximation. So, so by being deterministic, it, it costs plenty of information. So certainty costs plenty. And now there, there were, um, when computers started out, there were analog computers. They were digital now. But they went down the path of digital computers because they were deterministic. Analog computers were hard to predict and control. And you know they weren't obedient. Um, and so they didn't fit with the mindset of slave owners, which is, you know, control freaks, which is what all of this is about. So analog computers got kind of ditched. Now, when we've gone, you know, deep into digital computers and we're trying to make digital computers mimic the human brain and mimic intelligence, now they need that complexity. But unfortunately, nobody developed these uh, analog computers. So digital computers are plagued by a single thread of execution. And you, you always know something digital. If you, if you look under the hood, if you look at, at the schematics of an electronic circuit today, a digital circuit, you see all these little discrete modules and chips and things like that. But they all in the schematic have this little input saying CLK, <laughs> CLK bar. <laughs> what that is, is clock. This is they all clocked. And they all have to be clocked because they have to be gated in sequence. So you can have parallelism, but at some stage you've got synchronization problems and there are various well-known problems of synchronization in, in computing. But uh, in an analog computer or the human brain, every, nothing is synchronized, everything is parallel. And so uh, then uh, you start to see, what I'm saying is that we've made a big mistake thinking that logic is discrete and it's uh, it's stepwise and and has to be clocked so that you know you, you can you have to have the step order execution of of these logical modules. So okay, by way of analogy, let me explain it like this: a clocked uh, circuit 
and AI and computing, digital computing in, in general, is imagine a metaphor for, say, a city like Venice. And all the electrical pathways are the canals and the, you know, current is the water. It's kind of like, you know, think of it, the flow of the water going through all the canals is like the flow of the electricity through this electrical circuit. And electrical engineers don't like that analogy for electricity as flow of water, but it worked for Tesla, so let's go with it. Now, what you're doing in a digital circuit is that so everything is deterministic. So you would say they're all locks. On each canal, they're locks. And you'd say, you know, a transit is in effect saying this lock is open when you know here's the brilliance of a transistor is it, you can have a side canal in other words a bit of current coming in from the side and that is enough to open the lock on a main canal so so or stop it so in other words if you have a little bit of current coming through this little waterway on the side it can be enough there's a mechanism that then you know um, closes the lock and then, you know, you go down further down the canal and there's another gate and another lock and then it all loops back to come back to the first one. Hurrah! We have something that's starting to look like intelligence. Now, that's how roughly analogous to how digital circuits work. But now, analog circuits work like this and you can start to see how far away AI is from the human brain and from analog and, um, you know, deep, deep uh, complexity. So if you had another Venice that was entirely analog, um, you, would, you would have to imagine that there are all these myriads of effects. So in other words, they no well, you've got the best of both worlds because you have gates as well as, you know, the flow of the, of the canals is entirely open. So in, in other words, if you put an input into, say, one side of Venice, say on the main canal, you, you raise the water level. How that would propagate through in the digital thing is very predictable. It would go here till this gate open, this gate closed, bang, da 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 da, all the way through. Now, if you did that in an analog computer or this analog city that modeled uh, logic through the canals of a, of a city network, you raise the water level on this canal, it would flow through the city. Now, think about it it would be very very complex there'd be little eddy currents there'd be you know navier stokes equations if you had to model it digitally it it would be impossible because you would get soliton waves here you would get just how the canal bent the fact that there was a frog sitting on the canal here sometimes and sometimes not would cause ripples that would propagate through the city then in one you'd get incredible stuff happening you'd have you know, all these soliton waves you'd never see coming, they'd all converge in one, you know, in one convergence zone, make a huge water spout. It would look like freaking Disneyland. You can never get that out of a clockwork, uh, a clockwork canal system. So in other words, the very, very fine structure. And so from neurotransmitters, everything matters. It's, it's not just a synapse and a neuron and, you know, little symbols representing them. There, there must be shape and structure. Each one of those things is kind of like the shape of the canal that makes the speed of the wave come and, you know, how, do, you know, the equilibrium and the echoes and that they all must be in, in the fine detail that, that neurologists haven't got to yet. So in other words, okay, so let's sum up. There's, there's, there's this multimodality, right? There's also because it's, it's analog and it's, it's open, the, the, the structure, um, the mechanism in it goes, it's, it's, it goes all the way down to the plank length and maybe further. And all of those details bubble up. So you say, well, how long does it take to, can we make a city that's analog, uh, like make a Venice, where we do a logical system based on the waterways and the height of the water and this is, you know, how long would it take to just develop that? Just just do a training algorithm and just make it an electrical circuit like that. And you say, well, there's long evolution. And you say, well, you know, we, we evolved all those little things, that amazing little water spouts and stuff that you, all those little water features that would happen in that canal, in that analog Venice. 
Um, it, you could you could eventually mimic them with uh, discrete digital technology, but imagine how difficult it would be, and you would uh, you would also have to expend the sort of energy um, to brute force and train that system. You would have to spend the sort of energy that we've spent over you know three point four billion years. So yeah, the tree of life has just imagine how much energy was expended by all these organisms to get to the to evolve the human brain um, and you you can't escape that you'd have to do something similar and um, so in terms of scale and energy and stuff it's like ai is not going to get there i mean ever ever <laughs> but um, yeah so um okay so i'll, I'll pause there because I bet, I bet ryan's got a lot to say here but i i the, I'll pause here and then I'll come back to what I think is happening with intelligence and what we evolved to do. We didn't evolve to be goal oriented. That's a big mistake. I think goal orientation is stupid. Um, I think I mean I mean the goal oriented behavior. If that if you looked in if you under the opened the hood on an artificial intelligent machine and said oh it's goal oriented, you'd say okay then it's stupid. Now we say the opposite. We say it's you know definition of artificial intelligence is goal orientation in in a confined context, but or a closed context. But um, I'd say no. If it is like that, then it's stupid. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I was doing you know circuits, electronic circuits for line following um, automata and things like that. And so they're very very simple. They they just you know you just have two detectors and you know, the current gets bigger as, as soon as they, uh, they approach the white line and left and right. So goal-oriented things are impeccably stupid. Uh, and, and look at goal-oriented people. They are impeccably stupid. <laughs> but we, we consider them intelligent. Well, no, it's it's our alien cortex. And our alien cortex is stupid. So goal-oriented behavior is dumb. <laughs> yeah. So then you say, well, what is intelligence? And I'll say, well, I'll, I've got a good theory for that, but I better let Ryan speak because he's probably on hot coals by now. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, it, when you say goal-oriented behavior is stupid, uh, I think what's important about goal-oriented behavior is it's predictable. So it's legible to the system, and it's something that, uh, you know, if, if someone is chaotic or really uh, diverse in their thinking, um, then then that will be, you know, they'll be scorned rather than praised as intelligent. Uh, usually when someone is praised in intel as intelligent in society, it's when someone reinforces the the existing um, system, you know, in a novel way or an interesting way. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say that that predictability is what the economy is after. And um, I think that I want to clarify some terms. So uh, when we say AI, sometimes we're saying what the the current state of the art is, and sometimes we're referring we're referring to a general intelligence. So um, when uh, when we say we're never going to get there with AI, of course we have AI right now, and it's narrow AI and it's functional. Um, and the term to disambiguate these is usually AGI, artificial general intelligence. And that's the one that he was saying that uh, is probably not feasible uh, with the, the approach that we've been taking. Um, and then uh, an, another, you know, interesting uh, definitions or, or analogies, uh, you went to cities, which I think is a pretty interesting place to go because in many cases, uh, people have made the claim that artificial general intelligence already exists and that is society itself. Um, that the economy and, and uh, all of that is, is uh, you know, we, we, are, we are the neurons in that and, or the, you know, the, the component parts of that and, um, our collective intelligence emerges uh, to solve problems that n none of us could individually solve. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think that we need to be a little bit careful when we ascribe 
intel intelligence to either the human brain or the or society because if the thing that is fatal about our condition uh, is a part of our human brain or a, a part of our society, then maybe it's not so intelligent after all. Maybe that one percent of DNA that's different between us and chimpanzees doesn't account for uh, for for much of a, a a difference in intelligence there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we if if anything is intelligent at all, we could say it's us. Um, but I'm uh, I'm hesitant to to go there. Um, I think the the other um, aspect is that you mentioned that uh, you know the random noise um, uh, is clearly unintelligent, but we we also should point out that if if a uh, an artificially intelligent algorithm uh, says um, consistently only wrong answers, then that is also intelligent, or or it's almost as good as getting all the right answers because you can just invert the inputs or 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 something. You you need to know enough about the the structure of the thing you're describing to be able to get it wrong consistently, uh, as well as to get it right consistently. So that's that's another thing. Um, and then uh, yeah, I guess the the point about the the analog and uh, digital is a very very fundamental point. It's almost like a dualism. <laughs> type of, of point. We have discrete mathematics and and uh, and continuous mathematics, and we have discrete physics and continuous physics. I mean, I guess quantum physics is somewhat uh, continuous too, but it's um, uh, we've we get these this particle wave duality and these kinds of things. They're all very related to um, you know how we're trying to wrestle with what reality is, and um, the though those domains seem to be somewhat incompatible there's like an impedance mismatch between them so when we're when we try to represent one and the other um the you know the whole idea behind calculus is yeah you can chop it up into little chunks that are discrete and just get infinitely many of them and then um, maybe you can actually get to the smooth version um and maybe that's what ai will do we'll we'll chop up you know what the brain is actually doing into little uh little chunks and get in as much resolution as you like, but um, but he was saying that there's uh, that the limit there doesn't work. I I can actually prove it. Um, so uh, there's an easy proof, and you, that's what we're trying to do is really square the circle, almost literally. If you get a square wave, which if uh, if the digital universe was correct, if there was such a thing and it wasn't an approximation, you could have a genuine square wave. But you can prove in a number of different ways, from Fourier analysis or any any other thing, is that you can't have a genuine square wave. You can only have an approximation of a square wave that has rounded corners. And that's, that's the essence of why digital is wrong, is those rounded corners. You can never, ever have a square wave. This, this universe will permit smooth waves but not square waves so they're all approximations so there's always more information in the smoothness than there is in the in the digits and that's a lesson we just refuse to learn in academia yeah i think that's but true. it's literally almost squaring the circle yeah, yeah that's that's true it's there's there's a it's not quite a chaotic boundary but it's a um you know at the at the corners of the square wave, it's it's a uh, it's pretty funky up there, <laughs> um, uh, up and down squiggles going going pretty wild. Uh, it only smooths out in the middle of the square. So, uh, but I think the the issue is um, one where in in many cases I think intelligence is predicated upon that uh, the filtering mechanisms that you're talking about that inhibitory nature. Uh, the um, the ability to compress information um, and uh, select out what's salient from it. So, by um, I think the 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 that's where you're seeing the the LSD trip. You know, it's it's that 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 compression that that filtering 
is kind of uh, turned off, right? So you you're getting, um, you know, lots more input than than normally, and um, and it's it's running wild and it's not being inhibited, right? So um, I think that our and what's interesting there is that it gets to um, something fundamental in AI, and that is there are uh, two general principles, exploration and exploitation. So if you're looking at a fitness landscape, say, imagine a topographical map where you have hills and valleys, and um, say, the um, you could call that, say, a fitness landscape. The higher the value, um, or the, the lower the value, the more the optimal it is, or the higher the hill, the, the more optimal it is, according to some metric that you pick. So you pick the goal, you pick whatever, um, how you're going to evaluate something. But let's say, you know, to, to figure out a maze or to, to figure out, um, you know, uh, anything really, you can cr create a, um, a space which has this, this uh, fitness landscape in multiple dimensions, but we can just stick to like a three-dimensional thing because it's easier to imagine. So um, in in AI, a lot of that is you, you have to have search in some way to, to figure out what to do next. And if you are exploiting uh, where you are, the information you are, let's say you're walking up a hill. Um, exploiting is, OK, well, how do I get to the optimal place? Well, I should be uh, aiming to go up the hill as steeply as possible so that I get to the top. Right, but once you so that that gives you better and better refined results. But once you get to the top of the hill, there may be Mount Everest uh, to your left, but in order to get to it, you'd have to go down a hill. So that's you have to you have to go against the rule of 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 optimality, like chasing that to to get to the to the new hill that would be even better. So there's exploration there. So you need to jump from hill to hill, essentially. Uh, go, uh, like, randomize your position. Go go somewhere new, and then start climbing a new hill. And with enough um, of these uh, different paths that you take, you can eventually find a pretty good solution to whatever you're looking for. Now, the, the tricky thing there is that uh, I think this is often what is happening for people under psychedelic effects is that they the typical mind uh, modalities are such that they are constrained to a particular hill in their in their mind so if they're if they're in a neurosis they're stuck in a loop and they can't break out let's say they have some kind of trauma or they have some some something that they just can't stop recalling and and being focused on um, that's that's a local optima. That's in the in the path of least resistance in their brain, right? So they're they're just stuck in that. Um, under psychedelic effects, that kind of gives you the exploration. So you maybe it doesn't make much sense to go down the hill. Maybe you're going to see a tiger on the on the on the shelf, um, and uh, and it's not optimal. But it'll get you to a new place, and that new place in your brain maybe is. Um, is a a more natural optimum for for where you are in um, in that actual landscape. So um, I, I think the it's uh, this is also kind of an algorithm in AI um, called simulated annealing, which is like like cooling crystals. I, I mean, uh, he will know everything about that, both annealing and simulated annealing. Um, but it's a uh, uh, it, it's essentially if you were to take this topographical map and you toss a bunch of sand on, on the top of it, and then you start shaking it really uh, hard at first, it'll jump to all the, the valleys that, that it should go to um, more easily. But if you start shaking sl more slowly and more slowly and more slowly, all the sand will go, um, you know, at the um, in in the in the lowest parts of the of the topographical map. Right, it'll it'll settle to where the optimum solutions are, and that's simulated annealing. Uh, you can program it to do that, um, and it's also done with genetic algorithms, these kind of things. But that's that's generally 
um, something that's used in every um, uh, major artificial intelligence algorithm is, you know, e either in gradient descent essentially means that exploitation um, uh, algorithm. So if you if you're trying to do hill climbing, this kind of thing, that's that's used in gradient descent. You use that to solve things with uh, deep learning, and in general, um, it's a uh, um, it's a principle that I think we can learn from, both as um, when we're looking at our psychedelic experiences, as well as um, uh, drawing analogy to to how we ex uh, understand intelligence. They should both have exploitation and uh, exploration as a part of them. Yeah, okay, I've got a lot to say on this. So, yeah, I don't really agree that that's what's happening with uh, psychedelics. So, psychedelics are good for exploration. In other words, they're good for getting you out of a local optima or minima. But uh, anything that's kind of a premature optimized solution, they get you out of that because if you go back to my Hebbian wiring model, they artificially put you in a state of panic, so in hyperarousal. And so then anything, uh, the, it, it allows uh, wiring over much larger distances. So it uh, allows, so it, it simulates you getting off a premature peak because um, it, it has so many pathways out of it. It's kind of exact, it's analogous to raising the temperature in some kind of dynamic system so that um, it kind of melts. And so if you melt uh, the whole system, then you can you know, re anneal it and get down to something that's maybe, if you're lucky, more optimal. The, the problem is here is that there's this underlying assumption, which I think is absolutely fundamentally wrong. And again, it goes back to the scholar thing. So there's this pervasive idea that comes clearly from our alien cortex, which has really sent us down the, the wrong path. And that's this idea of problem solving. So there's this idea that intelligence is problem solving. And again, it's I think it's an utterly stupid idea. Because uh, problem solving implies that you have a goal. You have a presupposed goal and intelligence are things that get you towards that goal. And I'd say, no, that's, <laughs> that's not intelligent at all. Um, so, but that, that's become ubiquitous in a lot of our thinking. So even these guys in like deep mind, they said, you know, first solve the problem of intelligence and then use intelligence to solve all our problems. You say, guy, where do you get the idea that they're problems? that their problems and their solutions, and that's your left brain. It's mad. It's fucked up. There are no problems and solutions and stuff, except that you make out of nothing. So all this idea, even talking about annealing landscapes and, um, and exploration, is this pervasive idea that the whole world works from dopamine, that we have some dopamine is telling us that we must get the prize. And then we have this idea that intelligence has something to do with a maze. And a reward saying so, no 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 this is such a bad in a way this in in terms of theories this is a premature optimization this is a, a, a place where you're going nowhere right this is a local minima that you can't get out of and it's a stupid way of thinking so a maze is not in a test of intelligence so okay so say so i think a much better model we're thinking about what general intelligence is and what the human brain has evolved to do. And then from that, you can figure out the difference between us and chimpanzees. And, um, and so, uh, again, I think I it always come back to uh, it's a signal, right? So it's it has far more to do with signaling. So intelligence doesn't really work uh, in a simple model where you just say, well, it's it's goal-oriented problem solving. Um, I don't think that, for first of all, it seems idiots. It's like, how does, the machine's already intelligent if it has a goal. So it's the goal setting, the idea that there is a goal, you say, well, maybe it's just a mouse um, in a maze getting food and, you know, everybody needs food. And I think we've um, these, um, 
these things like getting food are it's it's our brain projected it's basically it's unwarranted psych, our psychology projected on the world that is not what a mouse is doing you might think oh a mouse wants food and it's going and it's solving the maze so it can get to the food and it's like ooh, this is a very very dangerous way of thinking you, you're missing some deep fundamentals on what the universe is actually doing and it is not little agents that want that desire things and then use their intelligence to get what they desire. That's fucked up with a capital F, and that's the basis of a lot of what what we we're doing. And then why why AI? Uh, so I can tell you from so many ways why this is fucked up. But, but that the, again, uh, you'll get to an end an to drum. You know, the very the very act of of doing that kind of pursuit misses some fundamentals of the universe. And I think the way to get to what are those fundamental of the universe is, is far better to think of intelligence only works when it's a communication between two parties. So in other words, take something like a Turing test. Is what you're really doing is saying, is this machine, um, does it think like me? And that the Turing test is saying like, do we have correspondence between, can we communicate? And I think that is very, very important. Intelligence is actually com communing between two parts of a system. So in other words, let's just take a wild leap back to the mouse in the maze. So the mouse is not going after the reward. It's the mouse and the hunger of the mouse and the potential energy of it is a disequilibrium. And what the mouse is doing is achieving equilibrium by going and <laughs> eating whatever the reward is. So you have to ima imagine uh, the entire universe is a disequilibrium uh, system and um, intelligence emerges as the opposite of, uh, you know, basically resolving uh, the disequilibrium. So in other words, intelligence resolves to create disequilibrium. It's kind of like a, uh, a complex knot in the energy landscape of the of the universe it's kind of like uh, dna is also like this it's it's kind of the 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 universe is just trying to um, get uh, equilibrium to an equilibrium state of a, of all parameters yeah i've heard of that definition but is the definition it, of being alive as well yeah 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 this is where i'm going this is where so so being alive i mean is is one it's a complexity that goes against the stream of this equilibrium so in other words, you know, DNA is, um, you know, a funny thing that happened to me on the way to complete equilibrium for, for the universe's point of view. Uh, so yeah. say, so, well, why does DNA exist? Because it's self-reinforcing. So and basically it's, it's going against the stream of the universe. It's saying, so it's creating complications for the universe. So in, in it's creating local optima. So the local optima in a way are intelligent. Um, because those are the things that, that, you know, the universe is trying to get to equilibrium states, but it gets frustrated in, you know, in, in terms of things like a glass, um, you anneal to a glass, uh, it's life and is all the discontinuities and imperfections in, in that uh, glass. It, it means those are what the structures are. And the reason why they exist is because, um, they self-reinforcing. So, uh, so going back to the video made on um, fractal theory of evolution. So, they they the reason why they self-reinforcing is because they have feedback back to themselves. And so, it's saying why? Uh, so you have you know, like I said, it's like um, you have these focal points of attraction and repulsion. You have feedback and you have filters. And so, those are the things that create the complexity that stops nature going in a straight line towards its optimum. So it's all trying to get to its perfect energy state and of zero equilibrium, but it can't really get there. It's trying to do Maupertuis um, least action. And so it can't take the path of least action because it's frustrated by these complications and these complications are a proxy for intelligence. So it's saying, well, what is intelligence? I think it's much better to look at it in terms of of communication. So I'm looking at it much more in terms of signal theory. 
then again, as soon as we start talking signal theory and Shannon and compression and stuff, <laughs> again, we've got it all upside down. We, it's, we, we fundamentally, our culture, our way of thinking, our alien cortex lives in upside down land. And so again, you just apply, you know, inverted. So what, what we say is incompressible is the information. No, the incompressible stuff is not the information. It's the compressible stuff that's the information. It's the repetition. So, okay, now that's gonna make people really upset. I'm sure some people are gonna get real upset with that. But think of it this way. If I do a Turing test, right? I, uh, if I say something like, um, I'm trying to see if this machine is genuinely, um, so if it has general, general intelligence and then, and so, uh, so you'd set up uh, a few controls that are humans and a few machines and say, can I tell the difference between the human and the machine? Well, the, uh, I think if I show you this example, so, okay, if I said to the machine, like, okay, complete this, da, 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 da. Now, everybody knows what comes next, right? Everybody on this call knows. But if I go, da, 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 you can almost hear it, right? The machine would have very, very difficult time trying to say that. If it was like Watson and stuff that amazed everybody by winning a Jeopardy and so it would say like, da, da, uh, what is surrealist? Uh, it would come up with all these kind of things. But any human can know that it's, if I say, da, 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 and say, what are they doing? And saying, I'm communicating to you. I'm saying, I'm interrogating you. Is, is your brain the same as mine? So in other words, it's, it's, uh, there's not some abstract tower of capability called intelligence that's super problem solving and stuff. It's like, no, it's not what intelligence is. Intelligence is communication and it's, it's identification of self with self. So again, in the Darwin video, then I, I said that uh, the reason why it exists and the reason why it seems to have got you know, intelligence seems to have evolved to get more complex over time is the same reason why uh, sexual organs tend to get more complex over time. And uh, the reason is it's, it's uh, to differentiate signal from noise. So for life to exist, you have to have a self-reinforcing feedback. You have to have um, a filter feedback that reinforces the signal. Because Why? Because of this kind of tautology, is if you don't reinforce the signal, then Boltzmann entropy will take over and you'll get disorder. So to get this kind of order, it has to be self-reinforcing. And, and that implies that... So the filter is to identify self. I think what you can see this in, all over in nature. The predominant thing is not some Darwinian evolution. They're things that are seeking self. So in other words, you can see in birdsong, and I gave the example in the video of birdsong, is that with a timing circuit, a bird can put out a signal that says, it's kind of like, where are you? You know, a wolf howling for a mate. All of them are saying like, where are you? Where are my mates? And uh, it can only differentiate from the background noise of trees and ambient noise and things by having an algorithm. So in other words, what it's doing is what I said in the beginning, is that you have to look under the hood to see what generates this output to decide whether it's intelligent. And so if you, you know, that's exactly what say, you know, in sexual dimorphism and things is uh, say a female putting out a call and males responding or the other way around is uh, they differ, they really saying, do you have this circuit in your brain? And it can be as simple as da 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 da. And they say, do you have that little circuit in your brain? Rocks don't have it. Other animals don't have it. And so you know, you can say yes, yes. Uh, and you, but you get into this, uh, you know, pick me. I, I have it. And then basically you make beautiful love. So it's really what intelligence is. Is since you know Abelard and Eloise and all its, you know, Romeo and Juliet, it's it's like finding life. It's uh, negotiation between communication. So it's communing. Um, so it means that you have to have a repetition uh, to communicate. So 
Now, it doesn't, it becomes uh, like dueling banjos because as soon as you have um, many parts that, you know, reproduce and reproduce the same signal, then suddenly the filter has more choice and then you need refinement. So you get into a dueling banjo situation because you're saying you're getting into ever finer details. So in other words, if it's a kind of a dating game, it's like, oh, you like movies. Oh, geez, I like movies too. Oh, do you like going to restaurants? I like going to restaurants too. Oh, we're a match made in heaven. Well, that's a very, very simple algorithm right there. And if the, say, female has more choice, assuming she's doing sexual selection, then she would say like, okay, okay, all the guys say they like movies and they like going out to dinner. Let's see what kind of movies you like. Oh, slasher movies? Okay, okay, you're out. <laughs> I was hoping you like chick flicks and stuff. But you see, they have to get more and more nuanced to make sure once, once there's noise. So in other words, the signal itself, as it repeats, it makes its own noise. Just because, you know, if you say that, 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 you'll get a thousand people, you know, 40,000 people will respond with the thing. He's like, oh, okay, I can't, can't make head or tail out of that. So making head or tail out of it, the pattern recognition, is you're saying, let's get more subtle. So, so part of the thing for a Turing test is to, is to really see and fall in love with a machine is you'd really have to give it more and more complex prompts and then saying it, uh, exactly, do you have this communing intelligence with me? In, in other words, exactly what I was saying with the IQ test, where I said this, you know, IQ test isn't a test of intelligence. Um, well, it's what it, what it is, is uh, like I said, it's, it's really a test for, uh, it's not for a test of an abstract scalar quality called IQ or intelligence. Is can you guess what the examiner was thinking? So in other words, the examiner is just like a bird putting out a call saying, you know, if I put out this, what's your response? Now, there are lots of responses that you could easily argue. In fact, that math blogger thing I showed you that you could put out any sequence or any response and it's valid. I, I can show you um, mathematically that, that you can have any mechanism or logic that will make sense out of any sequence. So that means that there is no intelligence in a response. It means it's mathematically provable. So, so, uh, so then what, what is happening with the examiner is what they're just saying is, do you have my kind of intelligence? It's the alien cortex interrogating all these poor kids who's saying is like, do you think like me? And that's, that's all that's happening. That's, so if you get a huge IQ result, like 160 on the IQ, oh, you're a genius. So no, you're just very good at communing with the guy that set the test. I think that's so why you have the, the G being so predictive of success in life is that if you are aligned to the system, therefore you, are, you have IQ. And so you'll be successful in the yes, system. Yes. Yes, yes, in, in a, they, they presenting intelligence, so in other words, just if you look at all these filtering stages in, in our culture since you went there, the, the, if you look in a job interview, the job interviews, they're not, you know, it's a, it's a silly game where they're, they're not trying to see what you know really or anything. They, they're often described as like, do you fit in or something like that. They, what they're really trying to do is they're filtering out people that, that won't play their game. In other words, that won't fit in with the algorithm in the company. And the game is always lying. So what's going on in an American corporation is they're stealing your labor. So they're going to say, are you, it's basically an interview is a subtle way of saying, are you going to allow us to steal your labor? And they always ask a, a very pertinent question to say, uh, you know, like they say, now, why do you want to work at this company? Now, they know, any interviewer that's ever asked that question knows that you don't want to work at that company. You want the fucking money. But why do they always ask? They want to see that you can lie. They want you to see that you can say, uh, you know, if you said the honest truth, say, I don't want to work here. I need fucking money or I'm going to die. And they said like, oh, well, that's true, but mm, a bit too honest. So fuck off, you'd fail the interview. But they want you to say, 
uh, you know, I looked you up on the internet and I see that you have social values and basically you're an ESG company and that's what I'm looking for because I also care about the environment. And they go, yeah, okay, you got the job. And the reason you got the job is because you're prepared to lie for a small wage and that's what they're really testing. So, so in other words, uh, there's, uh, the filtering process is positive and negative. It's, it's, so it's like, do, do you think like me, do, will you fit in with this this algorithm? And then that's, you know, all, and, and they're saying is, you know, to, they have a goal to make money. And then they're saying, will, will you fit in with the goal? In other words, can we shortchange you with less money and you'll still be in, in the goal? And so the, the whole system is antagonistic towards each other. But the reason why it works is because there's an attractor and that's money. And so people are attracted to work to companies because um, they they have uh, you know they have money. Um, that's the only reason they work. If, if companies didn't have money, <clears throat> I don't think the workforce would be because most jobs are shitty, and nobody would do them uh, if uh, if they didn't didn't get paid for them, which is a giveaway right there. But <coughs> yeah, but you can see why exactly as you're saying, right? Why our, our our society got to this is because we're thinking of it as goal oriented and problem solving. Now, the, the fundamental reasoning, the assumption that nobody questions that is so wrong, but it is a false assumption that, that no one dares question is, is, at, is there really anything, are there really any problems? Now, if you say this, then people get really upset. Uh, so Leibniz said it. Leibniz said this is the best of all possible worlds. In other words, you don't have to have any goals. You don't have to pursue anything. This is the best of all possible worlds. You can fuck it up <laughs> for sure, but there's no problem to fix. There is nothing wrong with it. Now, everybody lampooned him because, you know, they made, made Dr. Pangloss and stuff was how, um, uh, I can't remember who wrote that. But anyway, he was completely lampooned for saying that this is the best of all possible worlds. And they said, well, it's all right for him. He's, a, he's an aristocrat. And what about, you know, look at the injustice. Look at the rapes and murders and um, the corruption and the exploitation. And say, really? You can't think of a better world than this? It's like, yeah. So, but the thing is that if you look at all the, those so-called problems, they have an uncanny source underneath them. They all seem to me, at least, to be associated with the alien cortex. So when you look at all the imperfections that they say and they lampoon Leibniz about is, is this module of evil in our head, and it's the alien cortex. The alien cortex is making all these problems, and then it's offering the solutions. So it's saying, and then it's saying that's intelligent. But it's not. It, it's it's superfluous to requirements, and it's 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 kind of it's going to be short lived because if you think about it, executing to to completion, which is what it's going to do with our extinction, is um, it, it is pursuing those goals. I mean, look look at the the macro system and the big picture of the world. In pursuing all these goals, like you know, how do we make cities um, less polluted by horse manure? Oh, right, we make the internal combustion engine. Oh, Jesus, now we've polluted the entire biosphere with CO2. And then, and then like, oh, what are we going to do next? And we go on to, like, oh, nuclear. Oh, that'll work. I mean, this track record, this is going to work. So basically, we keep on doubling down on the problems and never seeing that basically solving, solving problems. There's no such thing as a solved problem. It, it, it basically is a, it's creating more problems. So anybody that, in my book, uh, how can you call something intelligence that goes to solve problems and creates more problems? So in other words, it's trying to bring things to equilibrium and making more disequilibrium. And saying like, well, yeah, that is kind of intelligence, as long as basically the disequilibrium doesn't annihilate itself, which is what happens. You see, if, if you just let the algorithm play out, you would, you would find that it was self-reinforcing. The signals would reinforce the signals and the noise would reinforce the noise and it would kind of equilibrate on a boundary of chaos. But 
I, I just wanted to, I'm sure Ryan wants to speak now, but I just wanted to say one more thing about uh, smoothness, that you mentioned smoothness. It's well worth looking at, you see, you might be wondering, well, how I get a fractal universe out of this, but if I, it's gonna, I can explain, but it's difficult. But I can actually show you things like, um, there's a, like Newton's fractal. Newton's fractal is an amazing thing that comes mm. out of mm. Newton's method for finding the roots of a polynomial. So if you think of a graph with axes, right? Um, then you imagine this nice smooth graph. It, the points where it crosses the X graph are actually the roots of the po polynomial. So, so Newton had this way of seeing, of seeing, you know, by approximation where the roots were. So you take an arbitrary value, say on the X and Y axis, you see, you see what Y is. You take another one, move a little bit to the left. And then you say, oh, is it really steep? So in other words, it's a kind of a hill climbing algorithm. Newton was doing a hill climbing algorithm on this graph like Ryan was talking about. Now, here's the thing. If you go and look deeply, Newton never saw this. Although it's called Newton's fractal, Newton never understood fractals. In fact, he had a blue fit as soon as he got on the three body problem. <laughs> he had a look at this, this monster in front of him and just ran. Um, but the so that approximation of, of Newton, if you then say, okay, what if you take arbitrary um, places around the plot? You'd say, okay, well, say there's three roots to this polynomial. Then what would you expect? You'd expect the the whole plane to be divided up neatly into threes. And you know, if you have a if you have a starting point here that you know uh, evolves to this root. And then you have a starting point here. You assume that'll resolve to the closest root to it. And the third root, say, in this polynomial, you'd say, well, you'd have this domain that's closer to there. And they probably kind of work out to have a nice little three zones around the roots. And, you know, you would converge on those roots. It's roughly like that. Except when you get to the boundaries between the two. When you get to the boundaries, then it suddenly gets very, very complicated. Just this side of the boundary will then take you to this root, just this side. So, so Newton's approximation just suddenly gets into this terrible froth of fractals. Now, when you look at those fractals, they're absolutely beautiful. They have all the structure. They got this infinite, you know, you can zoom in on them. And get this. Out of this, somewhere pops out the Mandelbrot set. You can see the cartoid and the little snowman and you think, what the fuck in the middle of a smooth graph solving polynomials Mandelbrot leaps out you know in your face and you say there's the smoothness of the universe is is hiding incredible com complexity and that complexity is fractal and so that is is kind of my absolute uh, slam dunks for why AI and discrete um, digital intelligence uh, can never get close to um, natural processes like the, the human brain in terms of general intelligence is is because we on that intelligence is 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 exploring that fractal area in so many ways it, it isn't exploring you know the the boundary condition on the edge of chaos yeah and so climbing um, algorithm that uh, that I mentioned only works in a smooth landscape. So if you have a chaotic landscape with discontinuities in it, then climbing a hill doesn't matter, right? You, you're just gonna, it's, you, you can't predict to, predictably go towards the solution. Um, yeah, so, so just wait, wait, let's just expand on that for the benefit of other people that maybe don't know uh, what you're talking about. So, it, so Hill climbing is, is uh, you know, finding kind of like Newton, finding the solutions to a smooth graph, like a polynomial in 3D space, let's say. Now, if you, if you just see what Ryan said, it's saying, if, if you have a complex or chaotic uh, landscape, in other words, the graph is, has more than two dimensions, then it's, um, it's very, or a dimension, you know, somewhere between two and three. So, 
if you look at, say, imagine uh, this 3D landscape or graph um, generated by a computer. If, if it maps to something like the real world, what you're measuring, it, it depends on how big your yardstick is. So in other words, if there's a little bump, you can't see that bump unless you have a yardstick that's smaller than that bump. So being digital, it means that you have to have a ruler of a certain dimension, like integers or something like that. It, it has to, it cannot have uh, infinite scale. Otherwise it becomes unworkable. But nature is using an infinite scale uh, ruler. So in other words, when I measure, say, the surface area of a bump in the real world, like a mountain, then I can say, well, if I use a kilometer size ruler, um, you can say, well, it's one kilometer on this side, one kilometer on that side. And you say, ah, oh, ha, 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 wait a second. Get a 100 meter ruler. Now there are a lot more bumps and you can measure a lot more things. And it's saying like, well, now suddenly the surface area of that mountain got huge. And you say, well, well, hang on a minute. What happens if I get a meter ruler? Well, now there are even more bumps. And now you're starting to see trees and stuff. And as you go down, eventually you get to the plank length. You know, it'll take you like the lifetime of the universe to measure a small mountain. Because imagine you've got to go through each leaf and then you've got to go around the little bumps on each one of the little vesicles on the leaves, and then you have to, you know, go around the structure there is a bit lumpy, and eventually you're getting down to the molecules, and the, you know, oh, those are lumpy as hell, and eventually you see like, well, this, this, you know, this thing which looked like it might have been a square kilometer of surface area, is now has a surface area of something like the size of the galaxy. So there's a lot of of stuff folded up into, and this is just a mountain, like what I'm looking at out of the window. It's like next time you go out for a walk, say, what's the surface area of the 100 meters around me? Then, you know, walk over to a tree or something like that. Go and look at the bark and say, well, if I measure all, all the lumps and little lines and stuff, and I go more and more and look more and more detail, I think, you know, the 100 meters around you is vast, vast. It's kilometers and kilometers, maybe. Not infinite, but... It, you get into limits, but if you had, had to navigate that space, it would take more energy and time than, you know, ain't nobody got time for that. If, this if, universe if we didn't have a, a Planck length, then yeah. it would actually be infinite, probably. Because So in, in fractal, um, it, when you're looking at a fractal, it, very often, like uh, if you look at Sierpinski's triangle or something, that has a finite area and an infinite perimeter. Like you, you'll never be able to find measure the the end of it um so it's uh it there um if you're using a ruler and you're measuring things uh, maybe you can get some smoothness rules uh you can apply mathematics and these kinds of things and that's what we do with uh, geometry and and you know you know trying to parcel out, out land with with our forestry and whatnot um but uh it once you uh if, if you change the ruler, then all of those things aren't um, pointing in the same direction anymore. You get different different derivatives, different different uh, uh, different paths up the hill that you should have taken if you use a different size ruler, right? So um, if you have a chaotic system or you have a uh, a a, disc, a, a non differentiable um, point in your in your landscape, then uh, th you don't know which direction to go it's 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 impossible to predict what you would go go to next and that predictability is what i think is um favored by the system and that's why we get this goal oriented behavior so especially the financial system re relies on predictability it um it, you if you're going to be making investments in capitalism you need to know that you know the the thing that you're putting your money in is going to give you more money out uh, and that re requires a bit of predictability. You need to be able to understand what's going to happen next. And what ends up happening as a result of that is that uh, there, uh, AI or you know the system in general will constrain us to be more predictable, rather than us, uh, rather than solving the more general problem. It'll it'll oppress us to make us simpler. 
And this is, if you look at what, um, you know, B.F. Skinner did in psychology, he was you know, like the king of psychology for a while um, because he, he was able to find predictable results um, in animal behavior by saying, um, okay, well, if I, if I starve these chickens and make them suffer, then lo, lo and behold, they'll learn to push the button uh, to get the food, right? They'll, they'll do what I train them to do. Um, but that's only because he made the system simpler by starving the chickens. And we will be made simpler by, by starving us of humanity through our social media feeds, through our education system, through our legal system. We will be made predictable and legible. And what you said earlier about the, um, that the goal-seeking behavior is trying to reach equilibrium, the definition of death is equilibrium. That is what we are trying to seek in seeking equilibrium. Life is disequilibrium. It is uh, the, when it stops moving around and it returns to the equilibrium, that's when the life is stopped. Like if you have dead matter, it's at equilibrium. And so uh, that goal-seeking behavior when, whether it's seeking money, like you mentioned with the job, or um, seeking something else, you know, it it generates death on the way there, um, because it's it's seeking that equilibrium, it's seeking that predictability, that simplicity, that that is, um, you know, oil and water with nature. Nature is a complex system, so if it if it is complex, it cannot be financialized. It must be simplified. It must be made orderly. And so must you be. And this is why when we, uh, when Hugh is saying that the, the universe is fractal in nature, that's why the universe is being destroyed by the, or the, the world is being destroyed because nature is not simple, predictable, and Newtonian in that manner, uh, which enables, which if it were, then uh, we would, long ago have conquered it all, right? Um, we're getting there uh, bit by bit now, but, you know, nature is putting up a good fight by being so complex and unpredictable. But, well, you, um, you, you can even hear it in the language it uses, too, when they say neutral and objective. Like, neutral is what a hitman uses after he kills somebody. Target <laughs> neutralized. Yep. You're neutral when you're dead. <laughs> I think I think this is a yeah, great but... extension on, on the Desiderata 3. Um, I feel, you know, what you've been talking about and 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 this navigation and this this uh, razor edge and entropy. Um it's 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 really that that we're talking about. I I, I feel that, you know. Yes, it is. It's fundamentally though. Um, on, staying on the razor's edge is is what life is is doing by being self reinforcing. But yeah, I think we, should, we yeah definitely go for the idea that AI is death seeking, and so artificial intelligence is primarily death seeking. But I think there's something more to to highlight about is is the way it gets to that death is is important, and so. Uh, Going back to something Ryan said about, say, the financial markets, you can see why the smoothing and predictability um, leads to to death. It's because it's it's fundamentally borrowing. So the smoothing and this predictability, uh, it comes at a huge price. Now people think that it's for free. They think that when AI optimizes something or does something really smart, that it comes for free. But it changes the game the mere fact that you're actually introducing it changes the game so for example just the way they thinking is a linear thinking that leads uh, i can show you why it's kind of like borrowing from the future because take for instance right now the stock market the stock market is they want the stock market to go up predictably you know the banker's dream is to have a two percent increase that reflects you know progress of humanity and uh, it would be stable without inflation, it would all be balanced. And so, but, but uh, because economic systems um, are feedback loops, they have kind of weather, 
and um, and they also have bankers which manipulate them. So they had business cycles. So ever since Bernanke, Bernanke was this consummate idiot of gargantuan proportions, and he did his uh, he his motivation was kind of like the motivation of these transhumanists because he was he. He did his thesis on the depression and how bad it was. I think he had some personal motivation, probably in his family, they struggled during the depression or something, I don't know. Um, uh, I think he had um, a personal dog in the fight, but his conclusion was that the, the Great Depression was totally unnecessary. They could have just printed their way out of it, which is absolute linear thinking. I just, I just, I can't help smiling, it's just so, so fucking idiotic. But anyway, so Bernanke comes in and then he tries to smooth everything out, make things predictable. And so what he did was now, whenever the stock market falters, he tried to smooth out the business cycle. And he, he achieved the opposite of what he was trying to achieve because it, it became the Bernanke put. It means that, you see, just recently, the in the last week, Everything came out bad. Britain's GDP went down 20%. 20%. It's like unheard of. It's like the it's like Rome burning uh, in 2020. And the stock market went up. It it rallied. It just it's just like um, the thing I posted with Verifuckers. And you're saying Verifuckers gave the reason why. And it's because everybody expects the Bernanke put. They they know that oh this is so bad that all the central banks, the Bernanke's of this world, have to basically print lots of money. So they, they start buying stock on the anticipation that the stock market is going to be boom. And you're saying like, well, now you're in deep trouble. Because you see how that that's smoothing. Now, if you look back, that every Bernanke put has inflated this bubble that eventually has to has to pop. But um, because otherwise you you got eaten in the ass from some other direction like hyperinflation, which is so they caught in every way they they've been boxed in at this this perfect storm of any way they go they fucked, and it all came from Bernanke trying to smooth the business cycle. So is in in not taking their lumps they didn't get rid of the the business cycle they just accumulated it pushed it down the road so that now we're going to have to take it in one big hit now. Anybody could survive the business cycle. This one big hit is probably going to wipe out everything. So you see why this smoothing and this predictability and stuff is, is not, uh, it's borrowing from the future. So it's, the, so in other words, again, it's kind of like the ruler. It's, it's like not following the dance. Is the universe is saying, okay, here's, there's a little fluctuation here. This is a disequilibrium over here. And now what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to say, got it, and then you equilibrize on the, you know, the plank length. If you really were, were in with nature, you'd be innovating and adapting as fast as the, the background quantum froth, you know. But the, the thing that is we're kind of out of step with the kind of wrong kind of ruler, the wrong kind of measurement, this kind of smoothing, it, it's not saying now we're winning. It's saying like no, it looks like you're winning like the same way as somebody that goes and does a spending spree on their credit card suddenly looks rich. Because just just because they've got a Lexus in the in the driveway doesn't mean they're rich. It means they've got a huge deficit. And our whole economy is like that. Our whole complex economy is say look at all the fabulous stuff we've done. Look at the cities and cars and planes and you know what's the what's the wealth that we have, the abundance and stuff, say, no, you've made a big hole of debt that we still have to fill up. So in other words, we, we haven't got anywhere. There's no such thing as progress. We've just rearranged things. And we've rearranged things in such a way that, you know, it's, it's a local optima for us. It, but it's breathtakingly it's stupid than, because we still yeah, have to pay it down. Debt. It's worse than debt. It's death. Because the where we borrowed from was nature, right? So uh, it, when you're talking about uh, Bernanke, he used that mindset to smooth out the business cycle. Well, Gates wants to smooth out the the uh, ecology with with uh, geoengineering, right? It's the same mindset. Let's borrow from the future, and then when it hits, it's going to be the biggest hit that that there is. 
yeah, as, lo as long as people understand that all of these things come at a price, and they, they but they don't account for the deficit because it's an externality, and then returns super intelligence will sort it all out. So they're basically like spendthrifts or you know, people getting up to their eyeballs in debt. Kind of, it's a kind of gambler's syndrome, and so they keep on thinking, well, we'll win big later. And say, no, because the win that you'd have to have just doesn't get delivered by nature very often. So, you know, it's kind of a log log scale. And so you're saying that we must uh, win like a gambler. We must, like, break the house. Um, and it's like, yeah, we're going to break the house, all right. <laughs> but we're soaring on the limb that we, we're, we're sitting on. So, yeah, AI definitely leads to death. Um, right now, I'll let you speak again, but I, I, I just remember this thing which I wanted to mention to you in in the last the last conversation we had you mentioned the fixed action potential of animals and I was I thought of a, a good one um, one that you mentioned but I I it lost it before I could express it and I just wanted to express it to you in case you don't know it but for, for the amusement of everybody else is for a long time they thought that you know they looked at ants and collective intelligence of ants. So, you know, ants build these bridges, amazing bridges of, uh, um, you know, in the Amazon and things like that, you get leaf cutter ants that bridge between leaves and they can go across rivers and amazing spans, all just with ants linked together. And so they, they thought, that, you know, for humans to do it, to build a human pyramid, if you've ever watched people doing a human pyramid, you can see there's a tremendous amount of coordination and cooperation and hierarchy and simplifications and, and all this until you can build a human pyramid. So, you know, they do exercises like this in the army. It's like, here's a few telephone poles and tractor tires and stuff, and here's, you know, 50 guys, um, you know, get across this river. And... You've got to use the intelligence and all, you know, to, to try to get across the river. And so it was a mystery of saying, like, how do ants with such small brains, uh, you know, just a handful of neurons, do such complex behavior? And um, they looked into it and actually found out what it was. And it gives you a little clue into um, why you have to look at the mechanism and not the output. So... Um, what they found was that the ants are super dumb. They just run in a direction. Say they're going towards food or something, following a dopamine trail or something like that. So they run, and then they get to the edge of a leaf or something, a precipice. And they just what they do is they reach out, just have an instinctive behavior to just reach out and see if they can get across to the next thing. And that's it. That's, that's all they do. Now, what makes the bridge is they found that if you just tap on the on the ant's back, so you just go put a patter, put a patter on the back, it freezes. <laughs> and that's all the bridge building behavior is. Because what happens is the ant comes, and while it's just exploring, trying to reach out to the next thing, and the, the, the ants, other ants are so dumb, they just scramble over the top of it. They don't even recognize that it's a fellow ant. And the minute they put a patter on its back, it freezes. <laughs> and then they do the same thing. They also reach out. And the third one will come and run over the two of them. So as long as they always have this pitter patter of other ants running over them, they freeze. And that is all it is. It just gets more and more extended. You get a, a, um, a buttress just extended more and more as all of these things run. But if you stop the other ants from running over their backs, they will relax. And then the whole bridge will fall down. And if they can't actually bridge the thing, it just becomes like a wave and it just curls around the obstacle is and it goes on but it, it looks like fantastic intelligence and all it is is a simple rule that says you know put a pad a put a pad on my back freeze <laughs> that's all and but you see all these motivational pictures and say teamwork you know and stuff and they uh, you know have them up in offices and <laughs> say like if you only knew that behind that was the dumbest shit you ever saw so in other words the motivational posters in offices are funny as fuck because what they're saying is, if you be a complete dumb fuck, it'll look like intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that sounds a lot like um, the simple rules that create flocking behavior. So you, you head in this general direction of your neighbors, don't get too close to your neighbors, and don't get too far away, and then you're done. Like, you've got the flocking behavior. Um, and, and it used to be thought that, like a in an alien cortex way, that animal behavior, they must be, you know, a flock of geese, they must be following a leader bird. The, the, the grand leader of the, the pack is going to be, they're all just following that, that intelligent leader that's, that's driving them forward. And uh, it's nonsense. You know, the, the complex behavior is all simple rules that, that you can boil down to just, um, you know, so any, it, what, what's funny about that, that leadership behavior is that it's not robust. Like if, if that leader um, bird has a heart attack, Where's the rule that says that you're you're all going to dive down into the into the mud with with your leader, like the like the lemmings um, myth, um, like there's there's no such thing in in nature like that um, where where it's uh, so brittle because it would have caused the extinction of whatever species it was. So when we do this hierarchical leader stuff, um, that ends up you know creating a you know. A single point of failure for us as well, um, but it just makes this. It's more scalable for for controlling larger and larger things through a pyramid structure. You know. Yes. Yeah, so, so that is is an important insight. So what what's happening there is again a simplification that's that's trading off speed um, for fragility. So in other words, you can see it in um, say generals and armies, how they constituted. There, there's an interesting anecdote I, I read once about a senior general um, that was captured during the uh, North African campaign. And he was um, taken to meet Rommel and he was sat down, you know, under guard. Um, and it, it was kind of dark and in the darkness he could see this guy in the back of a German staff car. And, you know, all these guys were running up to him and giving him notes and running. And he gradually started to realize, oh, my fuck, this is Rommel himself. He's sitting like 10 foot away from me. And he's running the entire African campaign from the backseat of this car. And all these little runners coming back in little slips of paper. And he was absolutely appalled because they didn't have an insight into how the German uh, intelligence and machinery ran. They didn't know how the general staff worked in Germany. They thought it was the same as the Allied side. And the Allied side had all these conflicting allies with different generals with competing interests and didn't really trust each other. And they could, they were kind of like left wing. They couldn't get the act together because people would argue and then they would go against the plan or second guess the plan to their own advantage. And it was all a complete freaking mess. And then they... Um, it took them ages and ages to come and a plan that was not very good. It was kind of like as good as you can come out of a committee. And then when he saw Rommel, then they suddenly understood why the Germans were kicking their ass so badly in North Africa. It's because Gen Rommel was making, he was a central point and he was doing the, the job of the anterior cingulus gyrus, in other words. And so he, um, he was made so he made decisions that would have taken them weeks to come to consensus. He did them instantly, like this. You know, just some runner would come up with a message, and he would just completely change his plan and something like that. But the problem is that that Rommel made very basic mistakes. That uh, you know, if he had somebody to second guess him or had a bit more of a staff, he wouldn't have made those mistakes. So in the end, he lost. But see what happened. The Germans, for a while, they they seemed invincible because they, they had that central control. It, but it was borrowed at the, the future expense of the direction of the Africa campaign. So eventually they lost and lost big. And But you see, that's again and again, you see this thing, big payoff in the short term. So they say, there's this horrible meme out there that says, you know, about technology and the transhumanists tell themselves. And they say, you know, when you look at AI and this complete hype that is, has more to do with the fact that there's too much Bernanke money and no home for it has got more to do. It's not, AI isn't making any advances. Don't believe all the scientific you know, press and all the hoopla and all these trans, it's, it's all a big fan club. It's bullshit, bullshit squared. And, a, you know, 
Xi Jinping's taken in by it. Oh, China's going to get to the head of AI. I was like, well, that's the end of China. If you pursue such a dim-witted goal, you, you, you'll get what you paid for. But this it's a big bandwagon effect that has more to do with money and, you know, um, speculation than it does to any real advance in, in AI. But what these guys tell you is they say, well, there's a, the, the thing about technology is it gets overhyped in the short term and underhyped in the long term. So the long term consequences have far more effect um, than, you know, and so it's like, guys, that's absolutely meaningless. It's like, what, what are you saying? Is, you know, it's, it's, think about it. It's saying like, well, it was overhyped in the, in the short term, but underhyped in the long term. That means no, then the short term was correct. <laughs> it's just stupid. So it's like, what do you say that we get this? Sure, there's longer term impacts. What they're trying to say is there's longer term impacts, not longer term successes. So that what these technologies do have high impact, high negative impact, catastrophic impact. So a more correct thing we say is you get early promise like Rommel, because you know you can move fast, but as things spread out and get more complicated, your past catches up with you. Just like if you get a bucket of water and you know slosh it over over an area of concrete, it'll basically it'll spread out, and as it spreads out and branches, it starts to slow down. It starts to you know the blitzkrieg turns into quagmire, and that's what we're doing with all this technology. We're doing a blitzkrieg. It looks highly impressive in the short run for linear thinking idiots that don't understand the universe. And then it leads to complications, and then that complications become Byzantium, and then you know they become excessively bureaucratic. You see, you see it the simpler it starts off with simplification. But but and and Ryan is right, they will make us conform to the machine and do, you know simplify our actions so that they conform with the limitations on the machine. But um, as things go on, it, it'll breed complexity because they're bound to have some kind of Tony Blair type idea. And they, they will say, well, we must have quality circles and we must have corrective behavior. And in doing that corrective behavior, they'll find all these permutations that will defeat them. So they will find while they can ignore all the corner cases and all the complexity, then it will bite them later because they'll say they'll make catch 22s and they'll say, you know, it's it's the same kind of thing. Like any bureaucracy, you say, well, you know, you, you can see in a bureaucratic country like Greece, it's like, you know, to, to get this thing done, you have to go and pay the small fee, which is like five euros, but you have to pay it in a bank. Well, if you the bank won't accept your five euro thing without a bank account. To do it, the bank account, you need a tax number. Well, the tax number was the thing you were originally trying to get. So it effectively means it's impossible to get a tax number. So then you know, then they would find this and they would correct it and they'd say, okay, well, you have to go to this department to get a form to say that you were the special case, so you can take it to the bank, then they pass a law. And then it's basically it's getting more and more Byzantine and more and more complex. So in the pursuit of of um, of that per perfection, in other words, it, with that problem solving attitude, you will create more problems. You'll have more problems to solve. Now, if you're an economist, you say, "Well, that's an economy. More problems to solve, more jobs. We're getting somewhere." And say, "No, you moron. You're getting to the opposite of what you're trying to achieve, which is predictability, abundance." And so you're going to you're going against your own things. So there's this in anti drone. Anyway, well that that's probably a good place to end. Is, does anybody want to say anything more on this topic? I I have something to to say uh, around um, you know in the 1750s uh, or so, um, uh, an Irishman <laughs> Edward um, Edward Burke Edmund Burke. Burke, um, you know, made uh, some observations in conservatism, which I find, you know, keep resonating with the modern day a little bit. Um, and that's the, you know, he was he was pretty against uh, some of the revolution, the, the revolution in France and stuff like that, um, because he his argument was that the systems that we have in society are complex systems, and if you go messing with them, 
you may find out that you can't control the complexity and like it's going to go crazy. So he was he was a um, a conservative, uh, and he wanted to retain you know the 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 royal situation. Um, and you know, you'll see some of these arguments like coming from uh, um, uh, Mr. Lobster. Uh, um, uh, JP. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he he'll be saying that uh, oh, you know, Christianity is is evolutionarily selected for to be the best thing, so you should believe in it. <laughs> and these kinds of things that that it has. Um, you, know, you don't go. Uh, upsetting the apple cart because uh, because everything's fine the way it is, which is, you know, it's the core of conservatism. But when you apply conservatism to actual conservation, where you are uh, essentially conserving the, the, the chaos and the natural order of things, rather than the artificial structure that that ha has put in put people into into the, you know, the prison yard that we're in. Um, then it starts to make a lot of sense that you know we can't do predictability in terms of you know our, our landscape is not smooth so why are we doing all this this exploration and exploitation um because we're just the only thing that we're doing is we're borrowing from the future then it'll eventually uh cause a, you know that i'm sure the french revolution wasn't um didn't go quite as planned right so um that kind of thing is liable to happen uh, with everything that we're dipping our hands into, and um, I don't know. I I thought that might be nice to to wrap up with. Well, it's, yeah, uh, maybe goes... we should explore that in the next. Maybe maybe we should explore that in the next one. What? what uh, so yeah. What? Um, what did you want to say, DB? Oh, I was going to say that, yeah, it's that goal-seeking behavior. You know, we want the sugar cube. We're going to move the goalpost, however, to get the sugar cube. Yeah, that's that goal-seeking behavior. I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, like, how nature resists that kind of parasitism. I could probably say it real quick. So there's this story I like this guy wrote that's based on, like, the natural behavior of eagles. And there's this young eagle flying around with his father, you know, learning how to fly. And his father bullied an osprey carrying a fish. And so the eagle got the idea that I could do that. So the eagle started bullying and harassing the osprey to get the fish. And eventually um, the osprey brought its mate back and started bullying the eagle and taking his fish. And eventually, um, yeah, they, so they kicked, they, they beat up that eagle, nearly killed him, started taking his fish. But the thing is, is, the animals eventually got bored of doing that and the eagle learned it's easier to catch his own damn fish and then the ospreys you know went back after the eagle stopped bullying them like i feel like nature resists that parasitism but you know with with um with where we're at we have this we have this ability to knuckle down on it and that's not good that's very well, bad. i believe we, we we have to stop like the eagle you know the eagle decided you know stealing from these um these osprey is actually taking a lot more energy and it's putting me in more danger than just fit, get, you know, catching my own, my own damn fish. <laughs> I, I believe more than half of the species on earth are parasites. Um, I, I think I remember that being true. So I don't know that nature actually avoids parasitism. Um, and it, that's, that's just a, that that's true but on i feel like on the scale with animals like us it kind of does a little bit it doesn't get to the extent where uh, so maybe maybe we should maybe we should go into this in the next one because this is opens up some interesting stuff and the um yeah, I, I would call those uh, symbiotes. So it's a, whether something is a parasite or symbiote is very it's subjective. But the yeah, I mean, since let's go over the things where markets go go wrong because what you were talking about, Ryan, is all those kind of conservative arguments and what, what's it is Carrington's fence or something is you don't remove a fence until you know what it's there for and. Um, and Adam Smith's uh, arguments for the invisible hand, 
was he was kind of saying the same thing as kind of laissez-faire capitalism uh, works and intervention doesn't. So um, uh, those are half truths in my view, and I, I think we should go go over them as why markets fail. And spoiler is that it uh, the capitalist system was a big feedback loop. So it's um, uh, Adam Smith's thing doesn't really work because. Uh, it leads to freeloading and so the and then that, that defeats itself. So the, the, I would say they're parasites and symbiotes, but they they're not in a stable relationship. They they oscillate, um, and that it is actually a chaotic um, relationship. So so uh, that that would probably be a good thing to to go over in the next one, um, and then so all right, well. Let's let's round it off there because it's we've got two hours and that's probably good enough for for one Sunday. Um, so let's just pause for relax and just come to a point of intelligence. There we go. All right, everybody. That was another cool conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Be safe Talk. out there. Bye. You too. It must be early in the morning for you. <laughs> yep, I'm. I'm up late.